But tonight, I, the title of this message is Control Yourself, and then I put underneath it, you can. We don't, we, what we lack in this country is self-control. And we, we, we push over it. We, we don't even acknowledge it. And so tonight, I'm going to take you through some scriptures and, and, and just help you to be encouraged um, to exercise self-control. What it is and what it's not. Self-control and self-discipline are different. And I'll go through those differences here in a moment. But learning self-control is about how your mind learns to rule or control your body, your passions, your desires, and your wants. How many of y'all did the 21 days of prayer with us? Yeah, it took, it took discipline to get up and do that. How many of you um, fasted during that time, like fasted food? How many of y'all saw when you fasted food, every commercial was about food, you craved food, your body screamed at you when you walked by the pantry, you heard this inside the pantry, eat me, I'm, eat, you need to eat this, cookies, candy. And if you notice when you fast, every commercial is about food. And somehow if it's not, you'll make it about food. They can have a car commercial and you're like, I could eat that Big Mac in that car right now. But that's your body screaming out. So part of the reason you fast, or one of the reasons you fast, there's many, one is just to begin to exercise self-control. And so hopefully you guys got delivered from some things. Like you didn't realize you could, but you can be free from anything. God is well able to do anything with nothing. With, with God, nothing is impossible. And so Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23 reads, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. That's, in other words, you can, you, can, you can have as much of these things as you, as you need or want. You can grow in them as much as you want. There, there is no moderation with the fruit of the Spirit. God wants us to grow in these areas constantly and, and consistently. And so you think, well, I've got too much church. You can't get too much church. Now, people, people become, um, they gorge on the word, some of them, but they never do anything with it. So they get, if you can excuse this term, they just get fat on the word. And the reason they get fat on the word because they're never doing it. It's never producing anything. So, so we got to understand, you can know the Bible, but if you're not doing it, you really don't know the Bible. And the only way to really experience God is the more we get to know the Word, it's not the only way, but the main way is we get to know the Word, and then we can experience God. And so 2 Peter chapter 5, verses, um, or ch chapter 1, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, I'm going to read from the Amplified because I think it brings it out. They call the Amplified a woman's Bible. Do you know why they call it that? because it's wordy. <laughs> so if I'm reading through the Bible like I am now, um, I don't use the amplified version. It's just too long. It's like, oh my gosh, what the heck? And, um, but that's why. They, so, but but I, used to, I used to study from this all the time. So it could be called a woman's Bible, but I use it. It's just, it's just hard when you read through the Bible for it. But here we go. You ready? For this reason, for this very reason, applying your diligence to the divine promises Make every effort in exercising your faith to develop moral excellence and in moral excellence, knowledge, insight, understanding, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, steadfastness, and in your steadfastness, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly affection, and in your brotherly affection, develop Christian love. That is, that is learn to unselfishly seek the best for others and to do things for their benefit. It doesn't mean enable them. Loving people doesn't mean not telling them the truth. You have to hate them to not tell them the truth. When you cater to certain things, like there's a big movement in the body of Christ today. Andy Stanley's probably leading it. Rick Warren's probably another one. They have embraced the homosexual community to the point that they, they say we should learn uh, their faith and courage, and that's, that's a lie. That's not true. Now, if you're dealing with that sin, you can be free. But the point is, God didn't make you that way. God didn't, didn't do that. Society, social issues, whatever, may have caused you to be that way, but you can be free. That's what we need to know. That's the truth. And so the Bible goes on to say, for as these qualities are yours and are increasing in you as you grow towards spiritual maturity, they will keep you from being useless and unproductive in regard to the true knowledge and greater understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, closing his spiritual eyes to the truth, having become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, believers, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Be sure that your behavior reflects and confirms your relationship with God. For by doing these things, actively develop these, these, developing these virtues, you will never stumble in your spiritual growth and you will live a life that leads others away from sin. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly provided to you. See, faith is to a Christian what gasoline is to a car. Gasoline is necessary to run your engine. Some say, I have an electric car. Okay, whatever. But most of us have gasoline-driven cars, and you can't, well, I could say this, to the electric car. Faith is the same as electricity is to those cars. If you don't have it charged up, it doesn't run. You don't put gas in a car, doesn't matter how beautiful it is, it doesn't matter what the interior looks like, how much kind of wheels you have on it, how you've had it painted. If you don't have gasoline, guess what? You're just going to get to sit there and look at it and admire it. And faith is our gasoline that causes God to move on your behalf. Chad and Yetta did such a great job on their testimony. I appreciate them doing it. It takes a lot of guts to do that. And now, now you guys, if you're watching, you, you, you're known all over the world. I hope that makes you feel better. There'll be some place you watch, there'll be some place that I've seen you, I've seen you. And then, the, oh, I watched the video. But they're, they're talking about faith. They took a step of faith. Was it scary? Yes. It is because it's the unknown. It always is. Because we just don't know, but God knows. So we got to trust that God will do what he says. So faith is to a Christian what gasoline is to a car. Gasoline is necessary to run an engine. But you need some other things as well, don't you? You need a working engine, number one. You need oil in that engine or it will burn up. You need vacuum hoses to release the, the, the things that need to be released. And, and uh, you need your tires aired up. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You can have the best car full of gas, but if your tires are all flat, you're going nowhere. And so you can add, you need some of these things to run a car more than gasoline. So our faith to operate better, we need to develop some of these characteristics or virtues. See, people believe and even say this, all I need is to believe in God. This is true if you are on your deathbed. So if you're on your deathbed and you just got saved, you say, hey, I, I, I need to be born again, and someone prays you to be born again, then that's when you say, I believe in God. But most of us aren't sitting here on our deathbed or you wouldn't be here. And so, but if you plan on living on this earth for a long while or for a while, you will need to grow your faith and add to it if you would. You know, if I could say that, you need to add to it. You need to grow in it. We are told to add to our faith, to become stronger, more fruitful, and more functional as believers. So you have to be in church. You need to be part of corporate worship. You need to be part of this. You need to hear the Word of God because only faith comes from here. But no, not only do you need to hear it, you need to hear it with the thought, I'm going to start doing it. That's how you retain it. People say, I forgot, but are you acting on it? Are you doing what what you're supposed to do. Are you doing what the Word says? Because that's the only way God can, can really perform His Word. And so there's a lot, there are so many dysfunctional Christians out here. Not in here, but out there. Not online, but someplace else. <laughs> but some people haven't come to Christ because of their dysfunction. How many of y'all know in every family you have some dysfunction? Come on. But you know why? Because nobody's perfect. I've gone to people's house and I look and say, we would never do that. And smother me, we would never do that. It's just kind of weird, but it's not weird to them. It's normal. But in every family, you have dysfunction, something. And what happens is when we get born again, that dysfunction just doesn't walk out the door. It doesn't like, oh, I got to go. It stays with us. And so what is the Word of God supposed to do? It's supposed to help us be willing to change our thinking, to change our lifestyle. And so you need faith to do that. Believing in God. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we need faith. But in faith, we need to add to our faith so that we can live a more satisfying Christian life and become healed from the dysfunction that we have. Today, it is very hard to tell the saints from the ain'ts. Why is this? Because they talk and act the same. The ain'ts act the same as saints. But what are they producing? They know the language. They know the lingo. They know to say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I'm doing good. They know confession. But what are they producing in their lives? See, we have a hard time in, uh, in America today calling out anything. When you hear a preacher say, don't worry about what the word says, this is our experience and we should go with that, you know they're false teachers. And just so you know, if any of you listen to Andy Stanley, he's the worst. He is not one of us. He teaches a whole different gospel and I've said it for a lot of years. People say, why are you calling him out? Because folks, we can be deceived in the body of Christ and our dysfunction won't allow us to see what we're supposed to see. But if we grow in these virtues, we can see what God wants us to see. If we grow in joy and faith and love, self-control, we can see it like, what fruit are you producing? And when you go against the scriptures, you're producing the wrong fruit. We should be able to see that. So God wants us to become healthy. That's why Jesus said, I came to heal the brokenhearted so that we can be more functional as believers and then our faith, and as we live our lives and our faith, other people will come to Christ. And so we are all in need of growth. We are all in need to learn and to continuously develop our faith. And as we do this, we must develop these virtues or characteristics. So self-control says no or stop. Emotionally, when you, it requires you to quit doing something, what we are, in other words, self-control is about, okay, I'm moving this way, I'm going this way, and I get so far, and then I stop and say, no, I better not, I better go this way. That's what self-control does for you. That's what it is. And so sometimes we quit right in the middle of where we're heading. Self-discipline, though, means go. It's always about go, keep going. I have to discipline myself to work out. I don't need self-control to work out. I need to discipline myself to work out. I need to make a time and say, at this time, I'm going to go work out. I need to be disciplined to get up out of bed every morning at five or whatever we got, you got up to do the 21 days of prayer. That was discipline. It motivates us to begin and complete new work endeavors. So for me to get up on a certain time, that's not self-control, that's self-discipline. For me to go into a gym and work out, that's self-discipline, not self-control. For me to push myself away from the table because I'm overeating, that's self-control. And so it's different, but people use them the same, but they're not. Self-control says no to the second donut. <laughs> Habits are challenged by self-control. Exercising control over your reactions and interactions and your emotions. Even when you have no control over the circumstances, we still control how we respond and act. That's self-control, not self-discipline. And I've seen people years past, you know, family in our church, when I was pastor in Roswell, they went through a horrific thing, and then they showed this woman on TV, and I was watching the news when I used to watch it. And I remember looking at my wife and said, can you believe she's acting like this? Now, it was really heartbreaking, but the way she acted was like, are you serious? She has no control over her emotions. She's going crazy. I knew she was hurting, but it didn't look good. And that's what happens with people when they lose control. Anger is a control issue. Moodiness is all about self-control, not self-discipline. And so we've got to learn to overcome these things. Even most forms of depression aren't clinical. It's just we have that. That's our key word in America today. Everybody's depressed. Not everybody has to be depressed. 
And we confess it over ourselves all the time. I'm just so depressed. I'm just so depressed. Well, hey, why, why keep saying that? You know, I don't feel good today. I don't feel right about this. I'm sad. We all get sad. But man, we, we act like, you know, anxiety is huge today. You know what? That's a part of fear. People are afraid everywhere. They're still afraid. And I think they're afraid because they've never given their life to Jesus. So we live in fear all the time. We got to control that fear so we can overcome that fear. My wife and I started watching this little show. She, she uh, recorded Special Forces. It's about these, uh, you know, ex whatever, Green Beret, Special Forces, Ops people. They're taking 10 like Hollywood people or people that are known and they're running them through 10 days of basically basic training stuff. And within the first two days, half of them left because they couldn't have, one got hurt, one got heat stroke or heat exhaustion or whatever. But some of them just left, they couldn't handle it, the pressure. These guys telling you what to do all the time, screaming at you, yelling at you. But they're developing. And so they always tell them, you got to control your emotions because they ask them to do creepy things. Like, they're pretty scary. And every time they'll say, control your emotions. You don't need self-discipline. You need to control your thinking. You need to control your breathing. I, I, it's funny to watch them. One of the special ops guys told one of the people, he said, if you don't get out of this car, I'm going to throw you around in it. When you deal with special ops, you just get out. You need to control your emotions and don't take a shot at the title because chances are you're going to lose. I don't care how big you are, these are bad people. I don't mean bad like, like bad, I mean bad like good bad like bad. So we need that. We need self-discipline too, but we're going to talk about self-control. We need self-control in our country. This gender stuff is a, just a lack of self-control. It's not a mental illness if you have road rage. It's a lack of self-control. You can't control your anger. You can't control your emotions. And today, the world of psychology, for the most part, is just awful. They're just, they make no sense. None. I watched the other day a program, just a little bit of a program where a psychologist was saying, when I raise my kids, I don't know what they are. I'm like, well, if they're born a boy, they're a boy. If they're born a girl, they're a girl. She goes, I don't raise them like that. I don't know what they are. They'll have to tell me when they get older. I'm like, how, how deceived do we have to be? See, that's all a part of self-control. They don't want to control self, so they just yield to how they feel. And remember this, feelings are not facts. Self-control is in the moment. Self-discipline is a way of life. Self-control is more primitive than self-discipline. It frequently, frequently refers to eating, smoking, drinking, emotions, anger, depression, etc. Some of you could probably think of some great examples. So it's about, I need to control these urge and stop smoking. Anger issues. Self-discipline is more advanced if you would, refers to achievements, arriving to work on time, staying focused. That's a self-discipline. I'm going to stay focused here. I'm going to keep looking where I need to look. See, anger must be controlled. Will Rogers said this, people who fly into a rage seldom make a good landing. And without this virtue of self-control, you will self-destruct some point. So we need to overcome anger. We need to overcome sinful anger. Sinful anger is anger without a cause. We're just mad. You need to overcome when you hate someone. That's a part, form of anger. We are only to hate sin. We are never to hate people. We can dislike people, but hate is another whole emotion. So we have to control that. I have people say, I hate that person. Well, you got to be careful. Now, I hate sauerkraut. I think I'm okay there. God probably doesn't like it either. He said, I made this right, and they've messed it up. I don't know. <laughs> and I don't really hate it. I just can't stand the smell of it. Someone made some at my house one time. We used to have some people over Sunday afternoons, and I walked in the house, and the first thing I said is, 
Who brought sauerkraut? It's, you could smell it. Then I went to the girl that did, and I said, please don't ever bring sauerkraut here again. <laughs> now, some people liked it. They ate it. Me, I was like, no way. But we shouldn't hate people. Now, we can dislike people. We, we will. There'll be people we don't care for and people we care more for. But self-control, again, is in the moment. So we got to overcome sinful anger. You got to overcome hate. You have to. It's all about self-control. You have to overcome the desire for revenge. We watch movies all the time, and you're probably like me watching them, like, get him. He deserves to die. Shoot him. <laughs> Cut him. Run him over. We even root for him. If you watch those movies where people are creeping up, I hear people even say, they're behind you. Like, they know. It's a movie. But we get caught up in it. It's escapism. We get caught up. We like our emotions to go from here to here. How many of y'all cry when you watch shows? How many men remember the movie Brian's song? Okay. How many of y'all cry? Come on, at the end. All right. See? And we do it. And, we, and, it's, and I mean, it's based on a real story, but it didn't happen in front of us. They were just depicting the story. And we're like, <laughs> like what the heck, man? He died. So we like our emotions taken on a roller coaster, but when it comes to real life, we need to control them. We can't fly off the handle. So we got to overcome this desire for revenge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I think it's okay to say, God, vengeance is yours. You know what these people have done? Then you deal with them. You need to control yourself with forgiveness. Forgiveness is not an option with God. It's a command. When you stand praying, forgive so your, fathers and your, your, your you know, Father in heaven can forgive you. We need to forgive. That's all about self-control. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. But it is a, a choice. So I have to control my anger towards that person or whatever it is and say, God, no, no, I've forgiven them. When I see them, Pastor, I still don't like them. Doesn't mean you didn't forgive them because it's not based on feelings. Feelings are not... So what are the facts? God said you have the ability to forgive whoever. Some people don't want to forgive because they don't, they're such a victim mentality that they're going to hold on to it. See, folks, you and I, in this, especially in this state, really all over the country now, we have to get delivered from the victim mentality because it will control and dictate everything you do and how you think, how you process, how you talk, how you respond. And it's unhealthy. It's not what God gave us. It's what the world gave us. So we have to overcome it. And so you have to learn to forgive. That's, uh, uh, that's part of being self-control. Nope, I know I don't like them. I know what feelings I have towards them. But God, I forgave them. But some people think, well, I still feel this way. Then I must not have. That's not true. You forgive by faith. And as you forgive by faith, then God honors that faith. But you're adding self-control, so if your emotions start going crazy because you see that person like, I'm going to go get them. I'm going to go give them a piece of my mind. Well, some people don't want a piece of your mind. So you control that and say, no, I've forgiven them. I forgive them. I purpose to. I've chose to. It's a choice. And you learn to control those emotions. Proverbs 7, 14, 17 Short-tempered people do foolish things, and schemers are hated. And so, when you're short-tempered, you do foolish things. How many of y'all have said things, done things out of anger that you regret? Come on. Oh, wow. And when you're in an argument, say with your spouse or somebody, words come out of your mouth, how many wish you could grab those words back? How many of you would say, you've heard about those words ever since you spoke them? So part of self-control is keep, don't keep bringing it up. If you worked it out, you don't get to bring it up 10, day, 10, out, 10 years later. Do you remember 10 years ago on September 3rd in 1981? You said this to me. That's what women do. And you know us men, when we say, well, you did this, most women will say, when did I do that? And here's our problem. We don't know, but we know you did it. And you want a time and date, you want a stamp. And here's what's crazy, when you women do it, my wife can give me dates and times. 
She's watching. Hey, Cynthia. <laughs> and I tell her all the time, and then I tell myself, I'm going to remember this, and when, I get, when we get into it, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to tell her the time and date, and we get into it, she's like, when did I do it? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but I know you did it. It's almost unfair. And here's what's sad. Most men, we don't even know if they're right or not. They just seem right because they throw out these dates on this day and that day, and we're like, So we got to control ourselves. Once you've resolved it, don't bring it back up. And the words, you always and you never, they're not real either. You always do this. I don't always do this. I do it some, but not always. Well, you never do this. You never take out the trash. No, I took out the trash three times this week. But you never do it. See, we like to throw those words around, but they're not healthy. They're not healthy for a discussion, an argument. And sometimes you're going to argue. I'm sorry, Christians. We have intense fellowship sometimes. How many of y'all have had intense fellowship with, with your family, your spouse? Come on. How many of y'all had intense fellowship when you, on your way here? How many men would say it was your wife's fault? Come on. There's some brave men in here. You better control that dude because your wife's sitting next to you. She's like, wait, wait till we leave then. <laughs> then she'll remind you on February 1st, 2023, <laughs> in a year from now, you raised your hand when he asked. I can't believe it. You embarrassed me. I'm not that bad all the time. <laughs> so you can say most of the time, so we must develop this characteristic, if you would, or virtue of self-control. In today's world, no one is required to have self-control anymore. What they say, do, act, or how it affects others, they don't care. They just don't care. That's why there's 538 genders now. When there's really only two. Every other gender after two is a lie and a deception. But... You know, I don't have to control myself. It's just like parenting as a parent. You know, I ask people, why did you have kids if they're such a nuisance? When you had kids, you got to watch them. You got to train them. What we want to do is park them in front of a TV, park them in front of a, a computer or a phone. My three-year-old can get in the phone and he does. And we use that as a babysitter because if they bug us, we get angry. Quit, stop bugging me. And we tell our kids, you made me so mad. You made mommy mad. You made daddy mad. And you know what, folks? They didn't make you mad. You chose to get mad because you have no self-control. Yeah, but you don't know what they did. Self-control is outside of circumstances. We can't control those, but we control how we deal with them. That's why you've got to exercise self-control. And some of us parent like we were parented. Even though we didn't like how we were parented, we become our parents. How many become your mom or dad? I've seen my finger come out, and I'm like, oh my gosh, Harold is, is here. Like, dad, you're in heaven. Just. It's like my hand and my finger get possessed at times. Like. And then the certain tone he had in his voice. Like in my house, my dad hated when you slam the doors or close the doors real loud. I can't stand it either. My grandkids play. As soon as they close the door, I hear Harold come out. Hey, hey, knock that. You don't slam the doors in Papa's house. I'm like, there's my dad right there. Big old Harold, man, I, I got gotcha. you. But it's not the kids that make us mad. It's not the circumstances that make us mad. It's a lack of self-control that gets us to an anger position. Pastor, that's difficult when someone cuts you off on the road. I know, man. I do know. You know, I have a pet, another pet peeve I, I talk about in, tra in traffic. When you're at a stoplight and it's green and you're turning left, go out into the lane. People just sit there and I'm like, I'm doing this to them in, my, in the rear view mirror like. I said, if you'll get out there, then I can get behind. We can both go when, it, when we can and yellow doesn't mean stop. Red means stop. Yellow means go faster and get through there quicker. 
I mean, that's my interpretation. I could speak in tongues and give you that interpretation if you like. I watch policemen do it all the time, like, here it comes, and they get yelled, Whoop. and they say, drug dealers drive like that just to see if anybody's following them. So I was told by a cop, you drive like a drug dealer. <laughs> I'm like, huh? what does that mean? They said, you, you, you went through every yellow light. You, and I said, well, I wasn't looking to see if anybody's following me. I didn't care. I just didn't want to catch the light. <laughs> but get out there. Don't, don't be timid. Be okay. <laughs> you know, I went out with a friend of mine who's head of security here, Scott Baird, years ago. I was sitting on the police oversight commission. He was a, ended up being a chief deputy for the sheriff's department. And he took me on a ride along. And he was a sergeant at the time over these special detectives and people that were, and he, his words, they were bad people. And so I rode with him one day and we pull up this first house and he, he looks at me and says, okay, pastor, here, look in the glove box. There's a gun right there. I'm like, what? He said, there's a gun. He said, we're serving warrants today to some bad, bad people. And he said, so if something happens, you get that gun out and you protect yourself. I'm like, what? Like, what? Yeah, he said, you, you stay back here, and if some of you get that gun, and someone comes, you just shoot them. <laughs> and so I watched them the first house they went to. You got cops with their guns drawn behind trees. You got them looking like the driveway, the garage sits out. They're looking in the corner. You got one guy standing on the side, going to bang on the door, and I'm like, this is real stuff. And then I'm back here in the car, like, I'm getting out of this car. I'm not going to get stuck in this car. I'm going to grab that gun, too, like. And so I watched how they worked. Then we went to this one house, and they arrested this lady. I won't ever forget this. And this woman and her family are screaming at them. They're cussing. I'm like cussing, like, you sorry. I mean, every word you can think of. I'm standing there, and the whole time I'm thinking, just whoop these people. Just beat the crud out of all of them. I, I'm, I'm shocked, that, and they act like they're not even talking. So later on, I asked Sergeant Baird at the time, he's the chief deputy when he retired, and I said, why didn't you just whoop him? Why didn't you just smack him around? He said, oh, we don't care. We're used to it. I'm like, huh? The girl even yelled at me, and you too, you sorry whatever, and I'm like, I'm no cop. I, don't, I haven't been trained to self-control. Girl, I don't know how tough you are, but you're in handcuffs. That's what was going through my mind, like, what? You, who are you talking to? I, you don't know me. But the whole time, these cops were oblivious to all this stuff. And all I can think of was, what incredible self-control. Because if it had been me and some of you, we'd have been like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> but you can see self-control. They had to control their emotions. So, cause it, and it probably was difficult. But they were acting like they just took her to jail, screaming, yelling, throwing a fit, all the family screaming at them. They're like, keep it up. We'll take you to jail too. Oh, no, I don't, I'm good. <laughs> so self-control. They didn't react to it. Now, they may have been justified like, well, he smacked around because of her mouth, but that doesn't work. Well, I got mad because this person, control yourself and you'll think better. It's when you get in a rage or anger, you don't think. Then you end up regretting it. With no self-control, nobody is held accountable. Not in our country today. And as long as you're happy, and this is the way I feel, then just do it. Because there's no self-control anymore in this country. And you and I need self-control. No regard for life is all about self-control. With God's help, we can operate, practice this self-control. You might be doing something, then you stop it and think, ah, oh, I'm going too far, let's stop. Or you say, I better not. 
That's self-control. Ephesians 4.26 from the New Living says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Ephesians 4.26 from the King James, same verse, says, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Some of us in here, men and women, have major anger problems. We fly off the handle. We scream at everything. Let me tell you another one, moodiness. How many would say you're moody? How many of y'all say you know someone close to you that's moody? A lot more hands, brave souls in the south. But moodiness is just simply a lack of self-control. I hate moodiness. I don't like being around moody people because you never know where you stand and you never know when something's coming. Just be consistent. Say what you want and then move on. In my offices, we have a thing. You, you, you know, if you're having a bad day, you better be the only one that knows it. You say, how can you control that? Because we can. I'm the boss. Moodiness is all about control. And moody people always blame everybody else for their moodiness. Angry people always bring someone else for their anger. That's why men abuse women. And then they come back and I'm so sorry. I do love you, but you did this. And then women start thinking. And even men now. I mean, women abuse men. I know some men that got abused. They just won't fight back. I'm like, slap me once, woman. That's a free one. You slap me again and we'll see. We'll see if all those movies are right where these 100-pound women are beating up 200-pound men. I don't think so. <laughs> but it goes both ways. And here's what anger and moodiness always does. It blames something or someone else. I'm mad because of you. I'm moody because of this. And if you get around moody people long enough, you, you walk on eggshells because you never know what mood they're coming home to or when you're going to get around them. Oh, I wonder what mood she's in today. Oh, it's not just women. I wonder what mood he's in today. Be, be quiet, kids. We don't know what daddy's going to be like when he comes home. How sad that you want to control everybody's emotions because you can't control your own. And God says, I can heal you from all that. But you've got to recognize it. You have to acknowledge it. And I'm going to go through a few things. Then you have to repent of it. Angry people become foolish people. See, I'm a venter. I vent. So I can get mad. I vent it out. I'm like uh, people that I count on, trust, friends. I, I just, I'll vent. Because when I'm venting, I'm processing. Because when I get in the moment, I know if I don't vent it out and get my thinking right, I'm going to do and say something that is not, that is not going to be good. So when I walk into a situation, I've already vented it. I've gotten it out of my system. I process and say, okay, stay calm. Even when people say bad things, stay calm. You can't blame anybody for your anger or anybody for your moodiness. Not anymore. Once you got born again, Jesus came to heal you from all that. And a lot of times our moodiness and anger are learned. You watch women that are moody, watch their kids. You watch men that are angry, watch their kids. They train them. You train them to be that way. And folks, let me say this to you. Ladies, if you're in a very abusive situation, just come talk to us. We'll help you get out of that. But here's the problem with abused people because of victim mentality. They, they ask, is he going to go to jail? I, I don't I think I can leave him. What will he say? What will he do? Who cares? What you should want, you need to get better before I go back in that house. Same way with women. You know, the Bible doesn't say that it's better for a woman to live on, on a rooftop than live with a nagging man. It always talks about the woman being a nagger. So if you're a man and you nag, you, you lose your man card forever. <laughs> but he does talk to ladies. You know, he tells, them, he tells the church, he tells it in, 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 the, in the Bible that, that, you know, living with a nagging woman is like living with a continuous drip. And people today think it's okay to nag. Well, you don't know what they did. You don't know what they said. It doesn't matter. God said it's not healthy. It's wrong. And when he says that it's better for a man to live on a rooftop out in the elements by himself than live with a nagging woman, here's what he's saying. It's better for a man to go up on the rooftop, live in the extreme heat, the extreme cold, the hell, the rain, the snow, the wind, than it is to live with you. And yet women 
And men too. I'm not picking on you guys. But God doesn't speak to men about nagging. And so we gotta, we gotta, we gotta control ourselves. These things are not, not healthy, and you, you could probably think of other things. With God's help, we can operate, practice self control. We can. So how do I begin to cultivate self-control? You ready? I'm going to go through these quickly. Number one, recognize you have a problem. Recognize you have an anger issue, a moodiness issue, whatever it is. And accept responsibility and stop blaming people for making you angry or moody or whatever. Number two, are you ready? Repent of it to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. Because it's not about trying harder. It's really, it really is about submitting to God and asking for his help so he can free you from it. Feeding yourself with the word of God so that you can have peace instead of always blowing up. Even offense, if you're easily offended, that's a lack of self-control. But in, a, in our country today, the media, the world, the ungodly have trained people, even Christians, and they shouldn't be training us to do one thing They've trained us to be easily offended. And folks, if you're offended all the time, it's because you have no control and you're always blaming someone else. They said this, they did this, they did that, and I'm so offended. I have Christians tell me, I'm so offended by the church. Like, what did the church do? Well, I don't like the lights. Whatever. I don't like all the LED stuff. Whatever. You people in the back like the LED stuff. I like it from here because I end up watching that more than I'm watching the person. How many are watching the screen right now? Be honest. I rest my case. You're welcome. We have these screens. And I'm 6'2", by the way, right there. But in real life, you'll say, he doesn't look 6'2", I know. But I am right now because I... What is the word I, what I, um, what is the, the thing people say today? Because this, I, I identify as 6'2". <laughs> Some of you said, well, you're not 6'2". Exactly. And if you're a boy, you're not a girl either. And if you're a girl, you're not a boy. Either way. See, everybody would say, you're a fool, but I identify as 6'2". Uh, that's dumb. Well. I rest my case. But see, we have a hard time hearing truth because we're not used to it. We think it's mean, which it's not, it's loving. And so you have to repent. And then you have to confess it as a sin. God, I recognize this as a sin. Being moody, being angry, unforgiveness, offended, it's a sin. And then you have to renounce it. God, I renounce this. I don't want to be this way anymore. And then you ask God to help you take back that you surrendered to the devil for whatever reason a long time ago. I can't remember not being angry. Well, you know, maybe something happened to you as a kid and that's, that's the spirit that got, got you, but it's not healthy. I've always been a moody person. They're so moody. And anybody that be honest will tell you they don't like moody people. I, don't, I, I can't. I have a hard time being around them. Because one day, you, I mean, one moment you're next, the next moment you're not. I mean, one moment you're good, the next moment there's a problem. Well, you spoke to me this way. You said this or you didn't say this or, you know, whatever. Like, I can't stand it when I drive. My wife used to do this. She doesn't do it anymore. And she'd, she'd tell me something about my drive. I'm like, I, I didn't ask. <laughs> and there's only one person driving this vehicle. And, and when, when she drives, I don't say a word. I don't care. I just watch her. Now, I may be pumping the brakes sometimes, <laughs> but I don't say nothing. And no one likes a backseat driver either. You don't stop. Go fast. Do it. What? what? Sit back there. Hush. <laughs> See, we can get offended over everything if we want to, but it's a lack of self-control because God said if you love the Word of God, the law of God, nothing. Everybody say nothing. 
nothing shall offend you. How much? Nothing. So it doesn't matter what anybody does or says, I'm not going to get offended. Why? Because nothing offends me because we love this. And the Bible says it's sin. And the fourth thing is, pray and ask the Holy Spirit for guidance and help. Help him to put a muzzle over your mouth and over your thinking. So if you start to go that way, he'll arrest it and correct and say, and you'll get that pause like, stop, don't, stop. Don't go any further, and you can back up. See, we will all experience anger, but how do we deal with it? And this is how. Cain was angry. God said, if you do what is right, you'll be accepted. Genesis chapter four, verse six, and I close for the worship team to go ahead and come. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. And that's what we're talking about right now. So we must subdue our emotions, feelings, etc. Today you are here. And if you feel a certain way, Today, that's what we hear all the time. If you feel a certain way, then that must be true. But it's not true. It's a lie. Self-control is what we need to exercise and add that virtue or characteristic to our faith. So here's what we're going to do tonight. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get right with God if you're not right with God. And then we're going to open up the altars as they worship and sing. And I want people to come to the altars. This is the altar today. You say it's a stage. Well, right now it's an altar. And sometimes this place is a good point of contact to come and say, God, I'm going to lay down this anger issue. I'm going to surrender. If I'm moody, if I'm easily offended, whatever it might be, you, you may have other things. And I'm going to surrender to you. I ask for forgiveness for allowing myself to go this long and this far. But God, I want your help. I repent of it. Repent means, God, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to change my ways, change my thinking. And then we, re so you repent of it. Then you ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me to put a muzzle on my tongue so the, these, I don't spew out all this anger and, and this offense and, and, and I'm not moody. Help me to heal my thinking that I would process different, that I would slow down that I would purpose to be more consistent. One of the things that as a young Christian, when I first got saved and started learning the word, I said, God, teach me to be steadfast. And I think most people that get around me would say he's always in a similar mood. I can have bad moments and bad days, but then I come back because I just want to be steadfast. I don't want to be too high. I don't want to be too low. I just want to be right here. So then people know when they deal with me, yeah, he's, he's usually pretty mellow or... You know, he can get excited about some things, but he, he's pretty consistent, and that's what we need, and that's what makes a stronger person and a better believer, just learning to be consistent. So as they come and sing and worship in a moment, I'm going to open up the altars and ask you to come. And you can come stay two minutes, you can stay one minute, you can stay 20 minutes. It's up to you, and they'll worship until everybody's gone. But first, I want to do this. I want you to sing Amazing Grace, just a few verses, and get down singing it. Just get down. <laughs> Carrie, your neck, go ahead. I want you to get down like acapella. Just get down with it. And Carrie, I'm going to have you do it in a moment. Go ahead. Amazing get down, Trent. Get, get dirty with that. Grace, how sweet the sound. Come on, man. Go for it. That's it. Oh, like me, I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but. Okay, 
I'm gonna have before we before we do that. Now I want Carrie to do it. Carrie, I want you to get down. Just get down with your bad self. Just is your is your parents watching tonight? Oh, go girl, go go girl, go. <laughs> I'm gonna have you do it too, because I know you grace, how sweet Come on. the sound that saved a wretch like me. I this one more time. I want you to do it. Come on. I know you can. You got, we got to, you got to go finish it off. Come on. Come on. I'm going to help you. Come on. You can do it. This will be fun. Go ahead. She can sing too. They all can sing. Go ahead. Go for it. Just get down. Amazing grace How sweet the same Come on, like me oh, yeah, yeah. I was, was lost Come on. but now <laughs> I found was blind but now I see. Come on. I Thank you, God. I'm telling you, you can control. You can have self-control. These guys just got down. Thank you all so much. Anybody else want to go for it? No, I can't sing. No, I, I got him. No, I can't. I can't sing. Wait a minute. I can't <laughs> all right, I'll do one thing. Because I can't sing at all. You guys are going to be horrified. <laughs> uh, okay, ready? This is going to be bad. You know what? They even told me one time I was up here singing with them, and I looked at somebody, and they said, you're throwing me off. So I turned my... I can't sing. Amazing grace. That's it. I got it. I can't sing. <laughs> but here it is. We got to have some fun. It's Wednesday, man. You can have a great rest of the week. But here's the deal. If you're not right with God, this is your moment. In all seriousness, this is your moment. If you've never asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, this is your moment. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So with every head bowed just for a moment online, I'm going to turn you over to the campus pastors. If you're here and you say, preacher, okay. See, as Christians, we can have some fun. If these guys didn't know I was going to do it. They just jumped in. Thank you so much. I owe you, don't I? See, when you, I owe you, huh? I'll give you five bucks. Thank you. I, 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 and I hope your dad and mom was watching because that was so good. Trent, I don't know if your folks are watching, but thank you. Probably, he said. But the whole point of everything we do is to come to this decision, to say, yes, I'm in need of a Savior. So if you're here with every head bowed and you say, preacher, would you pray with me? I walk with God, but I walked away, or yes, I'm ready. I don't even understand it. I don't know what's going on, but I know this is right, and I'm ready to ask Jesus to be Lord of my life. If that's you and you say, preacher, would you pray with me? Right where you're seated, are you ready? With no hesitation, just make a decision. Control your emotions and your fear. Just what we saw here. She was like, no, Pastor, no. And I said, come on. And she did it. Did she want to do it? No. 
But they did it without even knowing, and, and they, they controlled that, whatever it was, like fear, intimidate, like, oh, man, I, you know, I could sing with them, but I could sing a song, but you're just asking me to jump out there. It's the same way with this decision. You just have to make a decision to say yes to God. If that's you, in Jesus' name, with every head bowed, and you say, preacher, would you include me in prayer right where you're seated? Would you just lift your hand all over this place? Who am I going to pray with tonight? Thank you. God bless 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 you way up there. God bless you. God bless you over here. God bless you over here. Thank you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you over here. Thank you so much. As I look across, God bless you. I sound like an auctioneer almost, but I'm serious, guys. This is the serious part. Most of God bless you. Thank you so much. You just put up your hand, put it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm going to look across the top one more time. You want to join? We're all going to pray together. Then I'm going to open up the altars. As I look across the bottom section, anybody else? Say, okay, preacher, pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, you saw all the hands. I thank you for their lives. I thank you they'll never be the same because of you. I pray blessings upon them. Help them, God. Help them to serve you. Help them to grow and develop to be what you want them to be. In Jesus' name. If you lifted that hand, your hand, I want you to pray with me. I'm going to lead you in this prayer out loud. It's loud enough for your ears to hear your own voice. The Bible says we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth. Everybody that's right with God, would you pray with us? And maybe you didn't lift your hand, but you know you should. Just pray, guys. I'm going to introduce you to Jesus. Would you pray, Father, I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe he's your son. And I believe he is Lord of all. Thank you for saving me and, 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 and forgiving me. I choose to believe and ask that Jesus, as of this moment, is Lord of my life. I purpose to serve you from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's thank the Lord real quick.